I tell you why I'm so amazed by his faithfulness, because I know about my faithlessness. Amen? And yet in spite of who I am, and in spite of how I may wonder and come off track, he never leaves me. Am I the only one in here this morning who has had to turn to that verse so many times where Paul told Timothy, he said, I am confident that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of redemption. I want to tell you something. God started something in me, and he's going to see it through. Amen? He's going to finish what he started in me. Hey, as the kid song said, he's still working on me. Amen? I'm not there yet. Don't judge me by what I am now. Keep in mind what I will one day be. Not because of who I am, but because I serve a faithful God. And he said he'd be faithful to the end. Well, thank God for his faithfulness this morning. You know, if you ever start to wander off track. I told uh, our, our class this morning in our New Believers class, I said, if you will develop a thankful heart and you will begin to think about all that God has done for you, you'll forget about all the anxiety. So you can't be thankful and anxious at the same time. Amen? Right? Am I right about that or am I wrong about it? Y'all tracking with me or are you lost? You can't be thankful and, and, and anxious at the same time. You can't be thankful and have worry in your heart at the same time. You can't be thankful and depressed at the same time. See, if you'll start thinking about all God's doing for you and start stop thinking about all the things that you think, poor pitiful for you, are not working in your favor, you'll just have church all the time everywhere you go. You won't even have to wait till Sunday morning at 1045. You'll live in continual worship to the Lord Jesus Christ because he's always faithful to the end. I love that song, and I thank God for his faithfulness this morning. Well, take your Bible this morning to turn to John chapter number 1. John and chapter number 1. John chapter 1 and find verse number 40. And uh, I am uh, going to wrap a bow on this thing. If y'all just take that and just put it about right here, that'll be exactly where I need it to be. I just want to kind of put a bow on things. Now, don't look at them over there. Look at me right here. All right? Because there's no telling what that's going to turn into before they get up here. So don't look at them. Look at me. I know it's hard. But I, I want to put a bow on this thing. Hey, let me just say a couple of things real quick. Uh, there's so much that goes on here that many people don't know about. And I don't believe people do it for uh, the acclaim. But I, I believe when people serve faithfully, you ought to give them credit. And I want to tell you something, church. When we got Mikey and Kelly, we got a great couple. And uh, our baptismal heater has not worked for about six months. And Mikey just came down here and fixed it. And uh, I believe you all say thank you to Mikey. Amen? Um, Mikey does, doesn't do anything for, for anybody's praise. I can promise you that. And he would have been fine. Probably would have rather preferred had I not said that. But that's all right, too. I want, I want us to know... Uh, there are so many people, uh, and Max and Peter probably saying, well, we helped. They just stood there and held a flashlight, so we're not clapping for them. Amen? All right, y'all good with that? So, uh, so anyway, there you are, yeah. Uh, so, so I wanted to mention that. I also want to mention, let, let's pray for Kenny. Uh, he's preaching this morning at, uh, at Lime Branch, and, and, and we want to pray for him this morning as he's preaching over there with them. And, uh, well, I, I don't know... Uh, I saw Kelly. She must have went downstairs. Bless her heart. She's filling in for Kenny in, in, in kids' church, I'm sure. And so let's pray for him this morning. And then I want to say one more thing. I, I'm so thankful to see Cheryl back there this morning. Are you glad to see her here today? Uh, she's really been battling with it in and out of the doctors and the hospitals, and we're so happy to see her here this morning. Well, I, I want to put a bow uh, on this sermon series that I've been preaching through the month of February. I'm so excited about what I'm going to start preaching next Sunday morning. You ought to go ahead and start inviting people to be here with you. I'm going to preach a sermon series starting next Sunday morning on people you need in your life. People you need in your life. Um, and it's, just, it's, it's really one of the most uh, creative things that the Lord's ever put into my mind. And there are people all throughout the Bible who serve purposes. There are people in your life who you may not want in your life. 
But God has got them there, and he's going to use them to push you closer to him. And you keep praying for God to remove them, but he ain't going to remove them until you learn the lesson he's trying to teach you through them. There's a little teaser, all right? Got that? So I'm going to start that next Sunday morning. But through the month of February, I've been preaching on the subject of, uh, of, of God's call to us to be his witnesses. And I want to look at somebody this morning who I believe is the quintessential example of what it means. Not, not, didn't live a life of great acclaim. Didn't live a life of great remark. When you start rolling through the famous characters of the New Testament who helped in the establishment of the Jesus ministry and the early church, he's not going to be the, at the top of your list. But he is one of the most influential people in all of the New Testament. And you know why that is? Not because he stood on a stage and preached to thousands like Peter. Not because he went on many missionary trips like Paul. But because everywhere he went, he was looking for just one person to share the gospel story with and say to them, I have met a man named Jesus who is the Messiah, who is the Christ. And if you will give your all to him, he will change you forever. Most Christians won't stand on the stage and preach to the congregation. Most Christians probably won't even stand in a classroom and teach to a group of people. It doesn't make you less than, means God's gifted you in a different way. We, for some reason in the modern church, have made ourselves believe that the positions where everybody is seen are the positions that are most important. And I want to tell you something, that's not so. If everybody was a pastor, who'd listen? If everybody was a teacher, who would be taught? See, God gifts the body in specific ways. But there's one thing that you'll not find in the list of gifts, and that is soul winner. Because it's not a gift that God gives to certain members of the body. It is a command that God has given to every member of the body. And you know this. I've said this over the past several weeks uh, We've just really been looking inwardly at our church and we've been saying there's one area we've got to improve on. We've got to become people who are obsessed, obsessed with this need for us to be intentional evangelists. There are two things that most Christians will never conquer in their life. You ready for what they are? I bet you know number one. What do y'all think it is? Just say it out loud. What's that? I said there's two things that most Christians will never conquer in their lives. Sin. I hope we'll get better at that. But that is one that we fight with, but it's not one of the two I'm thinking. Number one, somebody just call out something. Money. Most Christians will never get victory over money. They will all their life be, ru be run by money rather than running their money. Did you catch that? I said all their life they'll be run by their money rather than running their money. Second thing, just really if you uh, just think about what I'm preaching, it'll give you the answer. Most people will never become intentional about giving to the church. Average Christian in America gives 2.5% of their income. I know a lot of us are giving tens. That means a lot of them must be giving Dear Lord, some of them must be taken when it comes by. I don't know. I, I mean, I can't even do the math on that. I'm not sure. But most Christians will never become intentional evangelists. They will never become soul winners. Jerry Vine said this. I'll never forget it. He said, what would it be like if on the day you entered into heaven, there was a waiting party there for you? The waiting party consisted of all of those you had led to the Lord in your lifetime. Most Christians would enter into heaven with no party, no celebration, no acclaim. Now, thank God that's a what if. It's not going to be that way, but it is the reality of the situation. And I preached a sermon last Sunday morning to really paint for you a clear picture because I want us to be reminded every chance that we get, 
That hell is not some mythological place that we have invented to scare people into coming to Jesus. It is a real place, and there are real people there like that rich man. And they will never, ever, ever escape. And it's not just about praying a prayer. I said that last Sunday morning. It's not a mere common sense decision. If it were that easy, nobody would go to hell. But it is about are you willing to give your life to Jesus and allow him to run and rule you? Those are the people who get into heaven. Well, I don't like those standards, preacher. Well, take it up with Jesus. He made them, not me. You know why the rich young ruler went away sorrowful? Because he couldn't have Jesus and his money. Because he couldn't have Jesus and his possessions. The rich young ruler went away sorrowful because he could not hold on to Jesus and hold on to the world at at the same time. James said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters because your allegiance will always go to one or the other. And I want to tell you something, 98.9% of the time, when you try to hold on to Jesus and the world, the world will pull you into their way of living told somebody just this week, one of the keys to being a successful Christian is when you first get saved, you got to rearrange your priorities. you got to rearrange your associations. That's why Psalm chapter 1 said, The blessed man does not sit in the seat of the scornful, nor does he stand in the way of sinners. Where does he go? He gets into the Word of God. Because this is the only thing that will give him staying power. And there is a world full of people who have no idea, no idea that what they've always been told isn't true. It's more than kneeling in Bible school as a young child. It's more than repeating something after a preacher. It's about living a life in total surrender to Jesus Christ. If I didn't believe that, hear me, If I didn't believe that, if I thought that I could be saved and do life my own way, I would not be a pastor. You hear what I said? Now, you don't have to be a pastor to be saved. It's not what I'm saying. that That was the life that God marked out to me, clearly, as a young boy. And for me to do anything else, and I tried, would have been to look God directly in the face and say, Lord, I know that's your will, but I'm going to do things my way. And there are millions of people all over the country. There are thousands of people right here in Polk County who name Jesus as their Savior, but they have decided they're going to go, as the song says, their own way. Find me an example of a biblical person who was saved and decided they would go their own way. Way. Never find it. So not only are we trying to win people to Jesus who are lost, we're trying to make sure that these people who are saying they're saved actually know the Jesus of the Bible and not the Jesus of the Bible belt culture. Did you catch that? I said we're making sure that they know the Jesus of the Bible and not the Jesus that has been crafted for us in the United States of America. And I want to give you a hint. The Jesus of the Bible looks a whole lot different. In fact, Jesus wouldn't even be welcomed in these fundamental churches because he didn't have a suit and tie on. He didn't have his hair slicked back with gel. He didn't have a short sleeve white shirt on. I mean, he would have been in a mess, man. And so we're trying to paint for them a picture of the Jesus of the Bible. Who did that? I would say if there's anybody in the Bible who did that very clearly, it was a man whose name was Andrew. Andrew. So I'm going to preach a sermon this morning very quickly. I'm, I'm not going to preach long today. Uh, I, I want to preach on three verses, and I'm going to preach a sermon that I've called The Andrew Life. Let's look at verse number 40. John chapter 1 and verse number 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon. And said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. 
And when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Let me just say this, and then I want to pray. What you just read there in that last verse is an example of the transforming power of Jesus Christ in the life of an unsaved person. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word and we thank you for how it speaks to us. Lord, as we come to this time of preaching, I pray that you would speak through me. God, I pray that you would do through this time what only you can do. And God, I pray that you would work through me, give me unction and anointing, and set my words on fire. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my strength and redeemer. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. Let me give you three things very quickly about the Andrew life. Uh, number one, I would say that the Andrew life is a life of prayer. I would say that the Andrew life is a life of prayer. Andrew is one of the least known disciples in all of the Bible. He was the brother of Peter. He was in the inner circle, in that four-person inner circle, not the three-person inner circle of Peter, James, and John. But he was in that other, that four-person inner circle that often we see throughout the Gospels. And very rarely do we ever see a picture of Andrew. In fact, he is always very much in the background. And yet, we learn as we study through the Scriptures that God used Andrew in a powerful way to bring thousands to Christ. In fact, we could say that had Andrew never been born, the New Testament and the early church might have looked very different. You said, Preacher, do you, where do you get that from? Well, I would say to you that on the day of Pentecost, there's a man who stands up and preaches a sermon to thousands, and on that day, thousands come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And that man's name is Peter. But have you ever thought about this? I mean, I mean, think about this. Stick this in your pipe and smoke it. Who led Billy Graham to the Lord? You ever thought about that? If you'll study, you'll find that a man by the name of Mordecai Ham, who was, was responsible for the salvation of the life of Billy Graham, he led Billy Graham to Jesus and, and was responsible for bringing him to salvation. And then Billy Graham led untold millions to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And I would say to you this morning that for every soul that Billy Graham led to the Lord, Mordecai Ham had a hand in their salvation. Isn't that amazing? And I would say to you this morning that every soul that preacher Peter left to the, led to the Lord in salvation... In the background, behind the scenes, Andrew had a part in leading them as well to the Lord. Andrew goes to Peter, finds him, and brings him to the Lord. Had he not done that, things could have looked very, very differently. In fact, we know for, for, for sure that you could take two books out of the Bible, First and Second Peter. And we don't know what else would have happened. The amazing thing about Peter about Andrew, excuse me, is that every time we see him mentioned in the Word of God, guess what he's doing? He is bringing somebody to Jesus. Homer Lindsay called Andrew the inviter. We can call him the bringer. Andrew didn't have the solution in himself, but he knew how to get them to the one who could radically change their lives. Now, let me ask you this. What was it that caused Andrew to be intentional every day of his life about living as an intentional soul winner for the Lord Jesus? I mean, am I the only one who walks out the door every day, grabs my gospel tracts, and says, today I'm going to win somebody to Jesus? And then quickly you find that the cares of life and the cares of this world overcome you. And at the end of the day, you're like, man, I didn't do a stinking thing to lead somebody to Jesus. And in fact, what often happens in my life is I actually reflect back over the day and I think, man, I stood right there. That person engaged in a conversation with me and I know they're lost and I could have shared with them about Jesus and I just flat missed the opportunity. Anybody else ever have that experience? I mean every day, every day. 
You know what I've learned in my Christian life? What you pray about, you become passionate about. And when you begin to get intentional about praying, see, this is an amazing thing about prayer. People think prayer is about moving God in line with you. But prayer is actually about moving you in line with God. See, most of us, if we're honest, our prayer life is more focused on our own needs than anything else. Our prayer life is obsessed with God, help me with this. God, help me with that. Lord, work in this situation. Lord, work in that situation. And we do not ever think about the fact that prayer is actually used to adjust us into the will of God. Not to beg God to get over here in line with what we want. So what if you prayed every morning, God, there's a song we used to sing, wasn't it a hymn, David? Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. Y'all remember that? Some of you remember that song? What if you prayed that every morning? Lord, don't lay some soul, but Lord, lay this soul. So so let me tell you what I'm going to challenge you to do today as you leave. If you remember in January, I gave you three different sets of papers. Y'all like January. I don't even remember what I did yesterday morning. Remember what you gave us in January? Well, shame on you then. I gave you a piece of paper in Jan- I gave you the first Sunday in January. I preached a sermon on continual worship. I gave you a packet of papers, and I encourage you to spend some time every morning adoring God for who He is. See, I told him this in our New Believers class. The problem with most Christians, we don't contemplate God. And I've run across a few people who's just bold enough to say, I, I figure I know everything I need to know about him. What an awful thing to say. When's the last time you just sat and thought about the fact that God had no beginning? When's the last time you just sat down and contemplated and Genesis chapter 1 when he said, let there be light, and you just thought to yourself, my, my soul. He, he literally just said it, and it was. We don't contemplate God. You know what contemplating God is? It's called worship. Start thinking about how wonderful, how powerful he is, not asking him for nothing, not even thanking him for anything, just standing in amazement. The song says, I stand amazed in the presence See, my quiet time is me standing in the presence of an almighty God. Sometimes I just need to contemplate him. It reminds me not only how big he is, but you know what else it reminds me of? How small and little and pathetic I am. And, and it doesn't make me feel bad about myself. It allows me to empower him. It, it allows me to give him the, uh, the lordship. I want to say permission because I don't like that word. God don't need permission for anything. But it allows me to yield myself to him in total and complete lordship. So I gave you some papers. I said, spend some time uh, every morning going through the Acts prayer model. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. If you, didn't, if you don't remember that, go back and listen to the sermon. Thank you, Eric. You got it all online for us there. The next Sunday, I gave you another packet of papers. And I encouraged you to each morning when you are going through your Bible to do something called a soap. Scripture, observation, application, and prayer. Very quick, I do one every morning in my quiet time. My discipleship group that meets on Tuesdays, we share with one another what we came up with in our soaps. So you know what that group does to me? Holds me accountable. See, if I didn't have accountability, I might say, oh. Too tired. Need sleep. I got people who's going to call me on the carpet, man, if I hadn't done what I'm supposed to be doing. So I do that every morning. Then the next week I preached on servant leadership. I gave you a packet of papers and I said, uh, what if every day you just woke up and you said, God, today I'm going to do one random act of kindness to somebody. It doesn't have to be a lost person, just be a saved person. I'm going to do some act of kindness 
Just to show somebody the love of Christ. Maybe baking a dozen cookies. Maybe sending them a card. Maybe sending them an encouraging text. And I know some of you do this. You know how I know you do it? Because I get random texts from you, and they say, I'm praying for you this morning. You're on my heart this morning. Just wanted to encourage you this morning. And you know what that tells me? You woke up this morning and you asked God, who can I encourage today? Now this is the truth about all humans. Left to our own devices, we focus on one person. Guess who it is? Oh, it's Jesus, preacher. I just think about him all day long, every day. He's the center of my affection. He's all to me that I could ever want. Please. First thing you think about when you get up in the morning is how hungry who is. You are. I thought it this morning. Where's that box of Pop-Tarts at, man? My wife buys Pop-Tarts for her and she gets mad at me because I eat them before she can get to them. So I have to be intentional about being outwardly focused. I'm going to give you the fourth thing today. It's going to be a packet of papers when you leave. First page is going to tell you five ways that you can get into a gospel conversation. You say, preacher, what does that mean? Here's one. What did you do this past weekend? Good conversation starter, isn't it? Second, the third page on here is a page that says, who do I know? Now, this page was a real watershed moment for me in my life because you know what happened? I sat down to do this, and you know what conclusion I came to? Blake, you don't do nothing but hang around with a bunch of church people. It's hard to win people to Jesus when you're only around people who say they're saved. So the Lord has really convicted me about just getting out and among uh, lost people. And so I'd, I'd pull the Randy Early trick. You know the Randy Early trick, don't you? It's called a run to Home Depot that should take 15 minutes, but ends up taking two hours and 15 minutes. Right? That's it. But it's amazing the conversations you get into. And I witnessed Randy do this. I witnessed him talk to people who are unchurched. I witnessed him invite people to church. I witnessed him tell people about Jesus. And you know what I thought to myself? See, you can learn from anybody and everybody, even Randy. I thought that's a doggone good way to get into a conversation with people that leads to an opportunity to share the gospel. And I told you about it. I did that a couple of weeks ago. So here's, here's an interesting way. Who do I know? Then the last page is what goes along with your quiet time every morning. There's a page at the bottom. It says, who am I seeking to reach with the gospel? And you write down their name. There's a line that says, what? What am I going to do to reach them with the gospel? When? When am I going to do it? Where? Where am I going to do it? You don't do a different person every day. You do one person until you do what? Until you make the, make the move. With that person. So funny, I was on the phone with Kenny Camp the other day, and he pulled up in his driveway, and he just said, oh, man, he said, you won't believe this. I said, what? He said, I've been praying that the Lord would give me an opportunity to share uh, the gospel with my neighbor, and he's sitting on the front porch. I got to go. He hung up. And a couple hours later, he gave us a report in our group message of how he shared the gospel with that guy. Now, I'm sure you'd love to hear another Bible sermon. I'm sure you'd love for me to take a passage right now and go deep and tell you all about the Greek and the Hebrew and all of those different things. But I want to tell you something right here. I want you to tune in with me and listen. You want God to transform this church? You want God to bring revival to this church? You want those baptismal waters to be stirred every Sunday? You want God to do something here that is unique? Not like everything else that we've always seen? You want to see God do a great move? It won't be because you hear another three-point sermon. We have heard those till the cow comes home. And it ain't made a lick of difference. And I'm not going away from them. That's how I preach. Expositional. Line by line. That's what I'll always do. I'm going to get back to it next Sunday. But I want to tell you what's going to change Young's Grove Baptist Church for the glory of God. It's because God's people will get intentional about getting along with God and doing what God has said we ought to do. And that is spend time with Him, study His Word, love the brother. You know that you've passed from death into life because you love the brother. And we get intentional about winning those to Jesus who we know 
are lost without Jesus Christ. How do we do that? We live a life of prayer. We live a life of prayer. Second thing we do is we live a life of preparation. We live a life of preparation. And that's what I want to talk about the second time. And um, one of the things that I have heard is people, some people have said that uh, they don't know how. What are you walking up here for? Are you trying to interrupt my sermon or something? See, some of y'all are creeped out. You're like, why he's walking up here? Well, Gary, I'm so glad that you came up here today. I, I want you to sit over here, and I, I just want you and I to just have a conversation about how your life is going this morning. And, uh, man, it's so good to see you. Uh, we're at Bojangles, I guess, and we're eating a chicken biscuit. Man, how's your life been going? All right, I do. Are, are you in a church anywhere? That, okay, so, yeah. The answer of hesitation uh, told me that, you know, maybe you dabble a li little bit in it. Um, well, man, uh, I just want to ask you a straightforward question, I guess. Have you ever uh, given your life to Jesus? Have you ever received him as your Savior and made him Lord of your life? I'm not sure if I have. Do you think maybe you're not exactly sure what that means? I just want to share with you this morning a, a very simple way uh, that you can understand uh, what it means to give your life to the Lord Jesus. Now, can I just add a side note in here? Obviously, you're not going to carry around a whiteboard, but you can do this on a napkin. So, Eric, just follow along with me. You got me? So, I, I want to give you three circles that I think will describe exactly what it means to give your life to Jesus Christ. This first circle I want to tell you about is God's design. In the beginning, God created this world, and he created it totally perfect. There was no sin. And he created a man and a woman, and he put them in the garden, and they were totally perfect. And he gave them one command. He said, do not eat of this one tree. That would give them the knowledge of good and evil. But they had free will. And they could choose to eat or they could not choose to eat. And you know what they did? They chose to eat. They took of that fruit, and they introduced something into this world that you've probably heard of, and that is called sin. Sin is the destroyer of all things. Sin could be something as simple as lying. It could be something as great as murder. But did you know something, Gary? One sin brings separation between you and God, and just one sin ruins God's perfect design for our lives. And sin introduces into our hearts and our lives and into this world a sense of brokenness. Sin absolutely destroys God's original design for us and leaves us with brokenness. And you know what we do, Garrett? We try everything in the world to try to figure out some way to remove this brokenness. We try relationships. They never fulfill. We try more money. They never suffice. We might try drugs and alcohol. Never do the trick. We might even try religion, but not relationship. And it always, constantly leaves us broken. But God was determined not to leave us in our brokenness. So he introduces this idea to us called the gospel. It just simply means good news. You know what the good news is, Garrett? God is the solution to remove your brokenness. See, he sent his son to this world. He lived a perfect life. He hung on a cross and died for your sins, not for his. He was perfect. They laid him in a tomb, and on three, day, three days later, I know this is going to blow your mind, but he actually got up. He rose from the dead, and he now lives in heaven. And he wants you to enter into relationship with him. And do you know how you do that? You do two things. You repent and you believe. And if you do that, if you'll repent of your sins, you say, Lord, I don't want to be a sinner. I don't want to live in sin anymore. I, I believe that you are Jesus Christ. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe you raised from the dead. And Lord, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be Lord of my life. I want you to do everything. I want you to control me. I don't want to 
chase after all of this other stuff. I just want to live for you. If you'll come to him with that heart, he actually will remove that brokenness and you can begin to live a life where you recover and pursue God's original design. In the very beginning, Adam walked with God in the cool of the garden, and they had fellowship. And if you will give your life to Jesus, you will be able to walk in fellowship with Him. And one day, He's going to take us to our new home where we're going to live forever. And in that place, God's design will be totally and completely restored. Is that something you think you'd be interested in doing? Can I lead you in a prayer? You could pray something like this. Lord, I'm a sinner. I know that I have sin in my life. I know that my sin separates me from you. Lord, I admit that I am a sinner, and I ask you to come into my heart. I ask you to save me, cleanse me of all sin. Lord, I ask you to come into my life and help me to live in relationship with you. And in my life, I pray that you would recover your design for me. I give everything of myself to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good job, Garrett. You can go back and sit down now. Didn't he do a good job just sitting there? Yeah. Now let me ask you something. Was that hard? Some of you are like, I don't know, kind of was. I don't know. You're like looking at me crossways. Literally three circles. God's design, brokenness, gospel. Three circles, three lines, and three phrases. And anybody can share the gospel. See, we've got to do more than just invite people to church. We've got to be ready and willing to lead them to the place where they can receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You say, preacher, I don't know if I can do that. You have a mandate to be able to do that. How do you know that? Peter tells us in chapter 3, verse 15, I can't, I'll be honest with you, I can't remember 1 Peter or 2 Peter, so I'm not going to say. It's one of them. He says, always be ready. Always be ready to give a reason, a defense for the hope that is in you. God's not asking us when we get comfortable to be ready to share the gospel. God is telling us today it is a mandate from heaven that we always be ready to tell a lost and dying world just what it is that is so great about this Jesus that we talk about. There's a lot of different methods and there's a lot of different ways you can do that. And you don't, you don't have to use this one. You can use any method you want to. You know which method I like? The one that people share. This one, to me, is the simplest one I've ever seen. And it's, it's really up to date. I think it's, it's used for today. You can write this on a napkin. You can whip out a piece of paper. You know the coolest thing? It's a great thing about living in 2020. Is the people who came up with this three circles actually made an app? Is that unbelievable or what? And you can actually... I never know which way to swipe, though. It would be awkward to get in a conversation and be like, hold on, my app's not working. And you can actually share the gospel just by swiping your finger. God's design, sin. I mean, even you senior saints have iPhones nowadays. Anybody can do it. With the simple swipe of the finger, you can share the gospel with people. You say, preacher, why'd you spend all that time doing that? Because I want to tell you something. We're out of excuses. We are out of excuses, and we must be getting serious about what God wants us to do. Let me give you a third point, and I'll be done very quickly. The Andrew life is a life of preparation, but then also, thirdly, the Andrew life is a life of purpose. It's a life of purpose. You know something, tradition tells us, if you read Fox's Book of Martyrs and other things, other, other historic Christian literature, tradition tells us that Andrew took the gospel all the way into Russia, possibly over to Scotland, and ultimately in a region called Achaia, Andrew was crucified... Many people say the reason he was crucified was because that he, he led the wife of a Roman governor to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was always winning people to Jesus. And her husband was so infuriated by the fact that she had turned to Jesus in faith, and when he demanded that she recant, and she would not, 
he turned his fury and rage toward Andrew and had him crucified for leading his wife to Jesus Christ. Legend tells us that he was nailed to an X-shaped cross. And they didn't actually nail him. They just tied him up so that his suffering would be prolonged. And that in the heat of the day, he would, over the course of several days, experience excruciating pain, and eventually, after a long time of suffering, he would die. Legend says that they crucified Andrew on the side of a highway, and that while he hung there, as people walked by, he encouraged them to come to Jesus and give everything of themselves to him and follow him in complete and total surrender. If you would, in your last moments of your life, still be so gospel-focused that you would lead people to Jesus, even as you were hanging there suffering, dear brothers and sisters, I call that a life of purpose. I call that a life that is lived for the glory of God and nothing else. You know what God's called us to? He's called us to the Andrew life. He's called us to be people of prayer, people of preparation. And He has called us to be people of purpose. We do not have time to waste. Can I close this series of sermons out with the words of Jesus? Jesus said, while it is yet day, work. For the night is coming when no man can work. We don't have time to waste. In the next moment, Jesus Christ could come back. And all those who don't know Him will be left in a world that they do not want to be a part of. As they come this morning and we bow our heads and close our eyes, I want to ask you a question. Do you know that if today were the day that you were to die, that you would go to heaven and spend eternity with God? Last Sunday morning we preached on the other place, the place called hell. It's a real place. Do you know that if you died, you would spend eternity with God? I have shared with you as clearly and completely this morning as I know how, how you can be saved. Repent of your sins, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can recover and pursue the way that God initially designed for us to live. Oh, if you're here this morning and you're lost and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to beg you, if you would, come this morning and talk to me, talk to somebody down here, and we would love to show you what it means to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you have wandered away from God. I would love for you to come and just recommit your life to Him. Ask God to begin to work in you. Maybe you're lax on your soul winning. Maybe you have lived a life just totally focused on self and you this morning want to focus on living for Jesus. Whatever it is you need to do during the time of invitation, I want to encourage you to do it. I'm going to pray for us and we're going to stand and sing. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. But I'm reminded, Lord, of what one said. It is only good news if it gets there on time. And Lord, we live in a world full of people who are on their way to hell. And one day it's going to be too late and we don't have time to waste. God, I pray that this church, Young's Grove, would get serious about sharing the gospel. God, if there's one person in here this morning who does not know you, who is walking afar from you, Lord, I pray that you would... Draw them through the power of the Holy Spirit to salvation today. What a wonderful day it would be to be saved. God, draw them to yourself and do in their hearts what only you can do. God, I pray that you take this series of sermons, however feeble and failing they may be, but I pray that you would work in them and do something in our church that would really just spark a wave of evangelism. God, everybody in this room knows somebody that's lost. Everybody in this room knows multiple people who are lost. And we've come up with all the excuses in the world. Well, it's awkward. Well, it's uncomfortable. Well, I don't know how they'll react. Well, I've tried. God, it's time to crucify the excuses, put to death the excuses, and get serious about winning people to Jesus as you've commanded us to do. God, as we come to this time of invitation, I pray that you'd use it for your glory and honor. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing. Oh.